Hey Marty, I'm your lizard buzzy, buddy. You're here to help you beat up Piff. Buzzy, but oh, you killed me. Ah, that's not nice. <laughs> Beam Software started out as Melbourne House in Australia in the early 80s. They are, in fact, maybe the first major Australian developer to get worldwide distribution and release for their games. They're pretty huge. Now, Melbourne House was a general publisher at the time. They did, like, uh, novels, textbooks, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Paper, old media. Then in the early 80s, they saw the success of the ZX Spectrum both in Australia and the UK, and they decided, hey, we want a piece of that. There's millions of people buying these games. Let's see if we can get some of that sweet money. So they put together an independent subsidiary called Beam Software. Now, it's important that they're independent. We'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. Beam Software, to its credit, made Melbourne House super, super rich. Oh my god, they made them so much money. This was mostly because of 1982's The Hobbit, for ZX Spectrum and other platforms. Reading about this game, it sounds almost impossible that this game could exist. It's a, a graphical adventure game with a really advanced text parser. Whereas other games back then were all like, get lamp or use rock on dog or something like that. <laughs> this game was all like, fill up your satchel and go talk to Gandalf about the elves or something. And it would interpret that and do multiple actions at once. It could interpret a full sentence. See, we were actually talking to this thing. That's really impressive, actually. <laughs> Shit. Not just that, it had an internal physics engine. Every character and object in the game had a weight and size and heft. <laughs> so you could throw different people in things and they would react differently. And it also had this, uh, this open-ended element where, like, other non-playable characters would wander around the world and do stuff, potentially killing off major enemies before you even get to them. It was, uh, it was the Far Cry 2 of its era. So <laughs> The Hobbit went on to be a million seller. It literally, literally sold more than a million copies, as did a few other Beam Software games. Melbourne House, in fact, was so impressed with their performance, they said, you know what? Screw those books. We're a game publisher now. We're not doing books anymore. We're all about video <laughs> games. And that was fine. Beam Software and Melbourne House made a lot of money between 82 and 87, I think. Mm -hmm. At which point, Melbourne House, the executives, decided to waste all the money and give themselves a lot of fat bonuses and then uh -huh. sell off the company and their distribution to Mastertronic, who was a UK publisher. Oh, wow. Uh, that basically left Beam Software out in the cold. They went to, to Mastertronic and they were like, hey, we published games with these people. You're going to keep doing that, right? And they're like, no, we're going to distribute our own stuff in the UK. Piss off. <laughs> so, oh, no. a classic case of a, a publisher screw job where yeah. the executives get rich and the people who did all the work get nothing. They got screwed. I love the industry, baby. Me too. I'm glad nothing has changed. So, Beam so... Software, <laughs> being the plucky Aussies that they are, they heard mm -hmm. about rumblings in the console industry. They thought... Hmm, okay, these microcomputers, they're kind of on decline. Let's see if we can move on to, uh, to greener pastures, to new publishers, new opportunities. And that's how they started making games for the NES. Oh. Let's get started. All right. Let's get started with their very first release. It's a game called Airwolf. December 1988. Right at the end of 1988, they made their grand entrance to the console market with... This. Okay, hold on. I gotta, I gotta hear the, I gotta hear the airwolf theme. Oh, yes. Pretty decent rendition. Gotta it's say. not bad. Let's start the dang game. You'll notice the publisher is Acclaim. Uh, many of their games were published by Acclaim. Here we have Airwolf Grandpa. I'm sure he has a name. He's in desperate trouble. We gotta go out. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not. Oh, look at those Oh graphics. my god! Wonderful. Oh, the classic boy. wolf in sheep's clothing. Alright, so initially when you play this, you might think, Oh my god, it's a flight simulator. I hate this. And then you quit. That's what I did the first few times I played this. If you stick with it for a few minutes, though, you find out it's actually very simple. What you do is you start any mission, hold the start button, which makes you go faster, and then you go to these little pips on the uh, the radar at the bottom of the screen. You go there, pick up a dude, 
and get the hell out of Dodge. You just exit the area, is all you do. I get swarmed. It's fine. Okay. I believe in you, Danny. There, mission complete. Great oh. going. <laughs> uh, cool. There's 20 missions of this. No. Really? 20. Well, you better get started, Danny. We only I have better about get two started. Hours. Yeah, we got a lot of games to get through, so I better get airwolfing. So, compared to their more ambitious stuff for microcomputers, this is a huge step back. <laughs> In fact, this is kind of an embarrassment. I can't even imagine what it was like working on these. Like, they were working with completely different, inferior hardware that they're... They're used to the C64 and Amiga by this point. And the switch to NES just really threw them for a loop, especially the artists, because good god. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different system, and yeah. Now, if there's one point I want to make through this whole stream, it's that Beam Software, super talented people, especially their 80s team who worked on the microcomputer stuff, these are people capable of great things. They are capable of great things. Yeah, we want to make a strong point here. It's not just that, like, <laughs> everyone at Beam Software was somehow just these terrible, incompetent people, which, no. It's just that bad games don't get made in a vacuum. It's mm -hmm. not just something It's that always out of happens. circumstances. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's a really extreme circumstance, because... They're just talented people left without a home, trying to scrape together whatever they had mm -hmm. uh, at the behest of known scum mongers like Acclaim. <laughs> yeah. They were kind of being taken advantage of, mm -hmm. but it's some relief to know that at least these games weren't very good. <laughs> uh, we're not playing their PC offerings because we are terrible at emulating those. Oh, I would never be able to play a text-based adventure mm -hmm. game. Do and people yeah. stream text adventures? That would be interesting to see. You could do like a bedtime story where you're like, oh, <laughs> pet put rock on dog. <laughs> and then Frodo went to Gandalf and said, I love you. And put rock on dog. And put rock on dog. It was just an example, Alex. I know, I know, but I've played enough text adventures where I've definitely rocked some dog. Yeah, you've put rock on dog. I def. Okay, so <laughs> I, uh... I had a buddy who uh, used to do interactive fiction, and they had me beta test their stuff before, and this was before, like, you could use Twine or whatever, so it was, like, old school. And I kept breaking his game because I kept trying to do things like eat subway seats. <laughs> <laughs> no one would do that, Alex. Listen, he wanted me to bug test, and my god, do I bug test. Oh, critical bug, you can't eat the subway seats. It would just, like, legit throw the game in a loop if you try to use, like... Oh, no! Oh, you killed Airwolf! I did. Uh, let's see if we can loop around and get these guys. Okay, here we go. This should do it. There we go. Oh, legit, there is someone who, uh, does... Hold on. We better get out of here. The locals aren't friendly. Oh, that pixel art, dude. Yes, someone does do uh, chill text adventure readings on Twitch. That owns, actually. Thank oh, you for cool. letting me know, Kuntan. I'm glad someone does that. That's a pretty interesting niche. He puts on, like, a, uh, the whoever streams, they put on uh, rain sounds in the background, too. That rules, actually. Wow. All right, I think I'm going to do one more mission, and then I think we've seen all we need to see of Airwolf. So, for December 1988, not too bad, I guess, for a US-released NES game. Uh, the quality was not quite up there, as it would be in the 90s. And the claim, they never saw a dollar they didn't like. <laughs> I need to fix the bit thing, because it's still appearing with that background issue. Oh, I've, cool. <laughs> I've tried so hard, but yeah, we got, uh, we got 25 uh, screaming heads. I see what you meant to say, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that screaming head has a name, Alex. I'm sorry. His name is One Bit Head Guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's Kappa's brother. Show some respect. Oh, good. You can watch Airwolf on Hulu. You know, I've never actually seen Airwolf. I've watched a lot of. I watched my. I watched Knight Rider. I watched. Uh, it's a show about a magic helicopter and the man who pilots it, and I that's it. I feel terrible. I first learned about Airwolf due to uh, that Aqua comic strip, which I'm pretty sure someone already quoted. <laughs> Thanks for the lift. I just. Yes, okay, Race Muckles bought Airwolf. It's true. I need, to, I need to tell Streamlabs to fix your stuff. <laughs> but thank you for the bits, uh, Dark Tetsuya. Aw, uh, no lives. Software. 
We are done. Airwolf is dead. I was hoping to get a little bit further, but I guess there's not much to see. Yeah, compared to Top Gun on NES, I'd say this is just as bad. Just as bad, in a different way. I can't, I can't say whether it's better or worse, it is just as bad. However, it does have rub okay at the end here. So oh, I love something. rub! <laughs> uh, no, I have never seen Manimal uh, K. Price, but I know of its existence <laughs> and I'm very curious. Now, fortunately, Airwolf wasn't the only thing that uh, uh, Beam Software did, because their second game came out just a few months later. It's Back to the Future. Oh, God. You've heard of this game. Uh, the NES version of this game. Yes. Yes, I have, Danny. Ah, Huey Lewis in the News is classic Power of Love. Note for note rendition. What? What is this? It actually is Power of Love, it's just sped up like 300%. And also the uh, main vocals aren't in, it's just the backing instruments. There's a comparison video on YouTube if you want to look that up. It's pretty good, actually. But let's play Back to the Future. I was tempted to make Alex play this, but no. I don't hate him that much. <laughs> Alex, I don't wish for you to play Back to the Future. Thank you. We've been... That is the best five-year anniversary gift mm -hmm. I could get. Yeah, Copy been... of Xanadu when I don't have to play Back to the Future on We've the been married for five years. Yeah, I probably wouldn't make you play Back to the Future by this point. I guess... I guess we're on that good of terms. So you're Marty McFly in the 50s, and uh, whether or not Beam Software actually saw the movie is up for debate, because all you do in this game is collect clocks. You gotta collect these clocks so your family doesn't disappear in that photo at the bottom of the screen. Now Marty is equipped with his trademark bowling ball, which you can use to shoot bees. <laughs> Otherwise it's just important you avoid everything and try and get to the end of the level as quickly as possible. Now, if you're watching this, you've probably seen the Angry Video Game Nerd or someone else talk about this game. And as often as I like to refute such people, no, this game sucks. It's a big old dog turd. <laughs> big old stinky poo of a game right here. This is just awful. Awful for 1989, awful for third party standards, just. why? Uh, Snaps asks if this is Ready Player One. No. <laughs> uh, this is Cass part of Ready Player One. <laughs> Cassidy is defending this game. And... Oh, really? <laughs> Don't I... be so indignant. No, Danny. I'd like to hear your arguments, please. Yeah, actually. I've opened the floor. <laughs> now, I remember reviews back at the time. Uh, Video Games and Computer Entertainment Magazine called this a lame paperboy ripoff, which kind of confused me at first because you don't throw papers, but. Yeah, I, I see it. All you're doing is walking down a street avoiding shit, only there's no point. <laughs> Often you don't even have a weapon, so all you have to do is uh, avoid bees and jump while you're collecting clocks. It plays badly. The level designs are bad. The music is this. It plays through this, through the whole game. You can't hop on a skateboard which makes the game have a, uh, an acceptable pace, I would say. The one cool thing about this game is you can jump at the end of the level, and if you jump high enough, you get bonus points. That's an actual fun and good addition to the game. The rest is pure garbage. Alright, now I want to at least get to the first bonus stage so I can show you what the true hell of this game is. Actually, Duffel Ray, that is a good question. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder how uh, places like Beam got in touch with the claim and other uh, shipmongers like that. Like, how did they first make? Like, how did they get in contact with one another to actually like work yeah, together? Yes, especially as an Australian studio. Yeah, right. Uh, I'd imagine that Acclaim and LGN and all those people were putting out feelers, basically being like, "Anyone, please make games for us." Uh, LJN at the time was contracting people like Atlas and other Japanese developers, so I'm sure they were looking for some uh, some other contacts around the world. And who better to make your games than the famous The Hobbit creators, Beam Software? They're good! They're good! I mean, they made a great game off of that Hobbit movie. Mm-hmm. Why can't they do the same for Back to the Future? <laughs> uh, Cassidy's explanation for uh, liking... Uh, we're putting you on blast, Cassidy. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me grab this real quick. So, uh, their defense, and I think this is actually a fairly fair defense, if, mm -hmm. I, if I'm honest, uh, their defense is that it controls just fine in these top-down segments. It's not aesthetically awful, IMO. 
The mini games are kind of fun once you get used to the perspective, and uh, I really like the way it handles the timer in the bottom of the screen with the flaking photos. It's not a great game. That is a pretty stretch. unique element, and it does incorporate something from the movie, so yeah, I'll give you that. It's a very fair, very, very fair. That's fair. The problem I do have is that essentially you're working with two timers. You've got a timer in the lower right, which uh, is the level timer, and then you got the, the photo timer, which is a distinct thing. It's not linked up to the timer. You'll notice when I'm collecting the clocks, it's not adding to the time. It's just putting pieces of the photo back. Very confusing and kind of complicated for such a simple game. Other than that, my big beefs are the fact that you don't always have a weapon. Uh, the game is super slow when you're not on a skateboard. And though the game's functional, I wouldn't say it's fun. They just made something that worked. It's not something you really enjoy playing. And speaking of the bonus stages, oh, I'll get to those. I'll get to the bonus stages. I think we're about to, actually. Lose Cafe, Bullies to Go. All right, get ready for a new music ass. track. There it is. Ah, the classic Back to the Future music. Blessed silence. Alright, I'm gonna actually praise this game. I really like the color scheme in this little part. It does look like a, an old pastel-colored 50s diner. I'll mm -hmm. give him that. I just like those. I, I wasn't even saying that it's good because of that. I just like the colors in general. I'm yeah. <laughs> now the trouble is, you're at an angle here, and it's really hard to line up your shots. And if you miss one character, this happens. So that's pretty funny. Marty gets his face splattered against the door. That's nice. So you think, okay, bonus stage over, time to move on. They sure threw you out in a hurry. And then you see the map screen, and to your horror, it throws you back a level. You have to get perfect scores on every bonus game to advance. If you lose and don't get a perfect score, you go back a level. You have to repeat levels until you get perfect scores in all these damn bonus games. <laughs> that bonus game there is terrible. There's others that are worse. And the one at the very end of the game, you're given one chance to get it right, and if you don't, it's game over with no continues. Back to the Future is a bad game. Yeah, I, I, Cass, not... I respect your argument. This game is not completely terrible, but boy, oh, I can't imagine how disappointed people would have been back then to think you're getting a fun game based on your favorite movie. In 1988, no less, you'd think, oh, they took a few years to make a game. This is probably going to be good. Oh, oh no. God. In reality, Beam Software was producing something like seven or eight games a year, so they probably only spent a couple months, if that, on this. And, yeah, that's why these games turned out that way. Now, in better news, mm -hmm. the same year, they also released this game. <laughs> it was a real banner year for oh, Beam Software, no. I tell you what. So this game kind of has an interesting backstory, right? It does, yeah. I actually recommend uh, looking up Bad Game Hall of Fame. There they have an article about Bad Street Brawler and its history. Yeah, Cassidy, promote your... Promote your... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, you get a, thing in our chat. It's, no, you get a uh, free a, promo. Yeah, it's a really good article, actually. Yeah, and he does look like Dale Gribble. It drives me wild. It's a mixture I, of Dale Gribble and Duke Nukem. Mm -hmm. It's really uncanny. Also, never trouble trouble till trouble troubles you. Now, before we get started, I want to make note. This is based on an existing game. This was previously released for C64 and other microcomputer platforms as... I had to write this down... This is Bad Street Brawler, a.k.a. Street Hassle, a.k.a. Bop and Rumble, a.k.a. Oma Shrek in Germany, which means either Frightened Grandma or Grandma Shrek. Let's play the game. Oh my god. Now the thing is, uh, and you'll, you'll get the point if you read that Bad Games Hall of Fame article, this was originally a parody. In the original version of the game, you were fighting, like, uh, blind people with walking sticks and little old ladies. Just, like, these really harmless people, and you were kind of played up as, like, an asshole, just beating up innocent people. In this game, they redid all the sprites, so instead of it being a parody, it's just stupid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, the little old ladies who used to fly with their handbags, they're now circus strongmen who throw uh, weights at you or something? And this was supposed, was this a Power Glove game, or was it supposed to be a Power Glove game? Uh, yes, when this was released, it was published by Mattel, who tied it into their Power Glove peripheral. And, uh, if you're unfamiliar with that, first of all, I'm happy for you. 
Mm -hmm. Second of all, it was a glove that you put on and you waved your hand at the screen to make uh, stuff happen in the game. And supposedly it worked with this game. Also, I'm beating up a gorilla who's throwing bananas at me. Man. Just Donkey, Donkey Kong's mad at the shit we've been talking about him. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here's my favorite part of the game, the end of the level. When you throw away all the weapons. Don't worry, that banana's not gonna hurt anyone in there. <laughs> that rules. <laughs> Other weird things, uh, you get a new set of moves for every level, so your controls aren't consistent from level to level. And some of the moves are way worse than others, so... I think... Okay, you get the trip in this level, yes, which is probably... Yes, I love the trip! The trip is probably the best move the in the game. The trip is my favorite move. Let's see if we can get it to work on this gorilla. Come on. Yeah, there Aww, we go. Aw, rub his little face. Aw. Oh, there we go. Gotta throw away that banana. Yeah, there, uh, according to Cassidy, there is a hidden move in this game that can only be used if you have the power glove. Yes, that move intrigues me so zap. much. Like, apparently, there's some move you can do with the power glove that acts as a smart bomb. It mm -hmm. clears the screen of enemies. That move is not capable of being emulated or duplicated with other controllers. It's, par it's currently a power glove exclusive, <laughs> which makes me mad. <laughs> All right. Stop. Oh, that, wow, that does not look right. <laughs> The yeah, chat's already talking about how he likes to, like, tickle and rub feet, and I am... Mm -hmm. He's basically just tickling people to death. And it looks so ridiculous that when you do it to a dog, a, uh, a cartoon bubble pops up that says, Good boy. Oh. <laughs> like you're rubbing his tummy. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Zimmerman Socrates put in uh, Funk Doc's uh, 2012 AGDQ run of Bad Street Brawler. Thank oh, Funk Doc that. ran this game? That's mm -hmm. awesome. <laughs> From the runner of Holy Diver, he brings you Bad Street Brawler. <laughs> hey, friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. That's a little bit too real, Bad Street that Brawler. That is. Oof. Oh, that's painful. So one of your two moves in this stage is the Stooge Hit, which is a classic Three Stooges move. Oh, it is! Uh, you'll notice it has a wind-up of about 50 million seconds. Well, so... that girl is gunning for you! Yeah! <laughs> Banana was following me. <laughs> So here's the thing about this game. You can laugh at it. It's pretty funny. It's pretty goofy. The art's bad. Everything about it's bad. But it's not as infuriating as something like Back to the Future. Uh, if you bought this game with the cover that it had, you were either a Power Glove owner or you knew what you were getting into. Like these punks here with the baseball bats, they were originally blind men with walking canes. <laughs> And some versions of the game, they they literally, they uh, they played it up like the main character was actually crazy. Like, they would have a ticker at the bottom of the screen showing his thoughts, and it would be like, Oh, I can feel the spiders on my brain. Oh my god. While you're beating up little kids and stuff. <laughs> so instead of that, they just made it stupid. And you know what? I can still kind of respect that. Same, same. Oh, the worst part is that if you die, you have to start the level over. Let's give this one more shot before mm -hmm. we move on. No, uh, uh, Sad Duke Nukem here does not Someone called him Incel Duke Nukem, and... <laughs> well, you see those shorts? He's gotta be doing that on purpose. That's, I mean, you can say that in our chat and I won't ban you, but it doesn't mean I like it. Okay, I'm not gonna beat this level. I did just want to point out that one of his best moves is the Cower and Fear move. He covers his head. Same. He's doing a duck and cover. I think, oh, I think we've seen enough of that. Yeah, okay. Okay, so 1990, a banner year for Beam Software. Uh, you're not gonna like them after I show you what they released this year. First, I'm gonna show you what they wanted to release. It's a game called Exploding Fist. Now, several years back, uh, Lost Levels discovered this game. And this, like Bad Street Brawler, is also based on one of their earlier games, uh, where it was called Way of the Exploding Fist. There's also a sequel, expansions, and here's a brief demo. You'll notice that the, the first screen it showed Beam Software as developer, and then it said published by, and there was a blank. Mm. My theory is that they were shopping this around, trying to be like, okay, we, you've, L, LJN, Acclaim, we've made your crappy games, can you please publish this? This is a good game, this is something we actually believe in. And it is actually up to three players, it supports the multi-tap. I'm gonna briefly show a match here, but in essence this is Karate Champ, but way better. 
And this would have been a smart thing to release because at the time, Data East's Karate Champ for the NES was doing big business. It was like really popular. And it was also really shit, so they could have seen an opportunity and actually released a good version of Karate Champ. Unfortunately, no one bit. Uh, this was an unreleased prototype. Now, I like it. It, it at least shows a lot more heart than their other games, even if it doesn't play super great. You just got kicked in the head. I did. But the characters are nice and big, the animations are pretty good, and hell, the three-player mode would have been like nothing else on the NES at the time. Let's see if I can beat this guy. If you want to know the secret to this game, it's the jump kick. You just hit upper right. And like Karate Champ, there's a whole bunch of different moves you can do by holding buttons and pushing different directions. But this is all you need. So I say as I get punched in the face. You're doing okay. There we go. Kick in the face. Kick in the face. Come on, more face kick. Oh, you got kicked I got in the kicked face. in the face. Reversal of fortune. <laughs> I still won. All right, we're one for one here. Let's see if we can end this match. Trella Radio Network, you mean like jump kick someone in real life? I've never jump kicked someone. Oh, that would be badass, but... <laughs> that seems too difficult, and I'm not a wrestler or a martial <laughs> artist or... Yeah, I didn't like what that guy was doing, so I jump kicked him. Has anyone... I don't know if anyone's ever made me angry enough to jump kick. <laughs> like, maybe online I read something and I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever read. And like I'm like, yeah, I start jumping up and down, just furious. But in real life, I'm pretty chill. Oh, is that what you're doing every night? <laughs> that's why it's all loud in Because I'm like, ah, ah, and I'm all screaming. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> it's because I'm, I'm, on la I'm on Twitter and I'm looking at the counts and it's dumb. I win. Hey. All right, so Exploding Fist would have been a good game. This prototype is a little bit simple, a little bit limited, but it showed real potential. And yeah, what they did here was just show the best thing that they possibly had to publishers, being like, please, please don't give us a licensed game to make. We hate them. We have our own games. They're good. Just give them a chance. LJN saw this, gave them a hard no, and then they gave them their next project. Okay, what was it? Their next project was Back to the Future Part 2 and 3. <laughs> Danny. Now, I admitted the original Back to the Future wasn't all bad. It was playable, very simple, but... Uh, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> this, on the other hand, is a crime against humanity. This game I cannot defend in any way. First it starts okay. Got an okay. opening intro. You got an 8-bit Biff Tannen right there. <laughs> Look at him! <laughs> Look at him! He's burning that money you spent on this game to light a cigar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And hell, what could have been more popular at the time than Back to the Future 2 and 3? And they advertised this as two games in one. God, that's a good deal for your money. It is. Kids want something they'll play for months. And they ended up with this. Okay, so you're in the bad 80s. Uh-huh. AKA the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> and hey, look, it's a spiny straight from Super Mario Brothers. Amazing. That. And also, giant snails have infested Biff Tannen's 1985. The thing I hate most about this is you can jump on the spiny. Okay, you that can't... pisses me off. I thought you couldn't, and I was like, oh, yeah, it sucks. That's pure horseshit. So they've turned everyone's favorite series of movies in the 80s into this, into the, the crappiest game. Rip. I do like the escaping hamburger. That's nice. Otherwise, there is really not a lot to like here. This is... oh my god. Is this... Danny, I have a horrible question. Uh-huh. Is this a mascot platformer? It is. No. You get to play it. <laughs> I'm actually gonna be... I'm gonna figure out a way to be having surgery when this uh, comes <laughs> up. And so you're just gonna be like, ah, oh, Alex... <laughs> Ah, uh, Alex can't play. He's getting he's getting unnecessary surgery. You're willing to get unnecessary surgery rather than play this game. That should tell you everything. Yeah, this this does not look fun. But looking at this, it really only tells you half the story. Uh, let me tell you what you need to do to beat this game. Okay. There's all, all these mazes. All these screens are interconnected through these various warps and teleporters and different uh, different time periods actually. You can get in the DeLorean and go between, between three different time periods, all of which look exactly the same, but they're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. 
Now there's no end point to this. You can't reach the end of the game just by running somewhere. What you're doing is you're looking for 30 historical items that are out of place, and you have to put them in their right place. That's, okay. That sounds okay, right? Well, to get all these items, you have to finish these awful mini-games, which are terrible, that are located all around the world. Oh, I missed a key. And you need to get keys that randomly spawn from enemies in order to unlock the doors that take you to these mini-games. And even if you do beat the mini-games, that's not the end. No, no, no. What you have to do then is take those items to a specific place and solve a word puzzle, and then, then, you can finally place that item and go searching for the other 29. By the way, is the dead end everything I did just now? What is that? That's my new persona. I'm I've never seen friend. that before! Hi! Hey, Marty! I'm your lizard Buzzy, buddy! I'm here to help <laughs> you beat up Biff! Buzzy, but oh, you killed me! Ah, that's not nice! <laughs> Rip. Now, how are you gonna get how are you gonna get Biff now, huh? I'm dead. Uh, the real awful thing about this, though, is the fact that you can get these items, you can go through so much trouble finding them, and then if you put them in the wrong place, because that's something the game allows you to do, <laughs> if that happens, you lose the item and you have to go back and complete the mini game and get it again. You have to do this for thirty items. That is called replayability, baby. It is. So there's this massive, just completely unexplorable world where everything looks the same, and it sucks completely, and it's no fun to play. And the gameplay itself, at a high level, is just pure tedium. And then, after you finally get all 30 items, good news, you unlock Back to the Future 3, which is the same thing, and you have to collect 30 more items. Is there, is there at least a train? I don't know. I've never gotten to that point. Maybe no one has. This game, if you're looking for the worst NES game, this might be it. You could make a good argument for this, because... Did you miss the key again? I missed the key again, oh, yeah. Oh, my sweet, beautiful husband. There's all sorts of little things, like the fact that DeLorean takes you back every time you die. <laughs> it doesn't let you skip this platforming. It's all like, no, 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 that must have been a mistake. Let's, let's try that again. This is a purely, purely miserable game. It may be worse than Family Dog. I'm not joking or exaggerating. Oh god. This, it's, only this game could rival Family Dog on a pure unpleasantness level. I'm, I'm looking forward to when we have to play and rank that for, uh, yeah. Well, there's a door over there, but I need the key. And each time you spawn the key, it just disappears into the ether. Yeah, do you see the problems with this game? <laughs> yes! It's not one thing. It's numerous, terrible things that nobody should ever do in a video game, and they did them all. So mad were they that LGN didn't publish Exploding Fist that they took it out on the Kids of America. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna send him to, to the UN court here for the crimes. <laughs> they, I, they did good things in the future. Let me get to that. Yeah, and we, we're, again, we're not all shitting on being software. Let me reiterate, these are talented people forced into a terrible situation that they were completely unprepared for. However... You got it, you got it. Some things just aren't forgivable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this uh, is one of them. Strong Sad in chat asks, Danny, Alex, have you played Plock? Plock is pretty good. We have played Plock, and in fact, we have a we, we talk about ranking. We actually have a show we do on Fridays where we uh, play and rank mascot platformers, and uh, we've we've played Plock, oh, and we've we had many arguments about Plock. Oh, this looks see, this cool. is a mini game where you have different graphics. Your character is super small, and you got to get all these clocks in order to uh, I don't know. It's busy work. Who cares? You kids will play anything. Bonk. And yeah, if you die, you lose a life, you get booted out, and you have to find another freaking key before you're allowed back in. <laughs> so you can place one of 30 items in 30 different places. Oh. No! No! No. This game is ambitious in all the wrong ways. <laughs> Do not play this. <laughs> this game makes me mad just thinking about it. Alright, so you move on? But let's, let's move on. Mm -hmm. So, eventually they found their niche. Also in 1991, they released a game called Aussie Rules Footy. Now, unlike the other games we played, this actually is an Australian exclusive. This was only released in the Australian region. Only playable on PAL NES consoles. And what this is, this is backwards nightmare football. <laughs> You'll see. 
I like all the graffiti. Mm-hmm. Oh, J.R.R. Is that J.R.R. Tolkien? I don't know, but uh, Elvis lives. Cool. Look at this! <laughs> what is this, Quidditch? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sure this is a real sport. No, we're, we're we, we like... <laughs> we both missed the freaking ball. <laughs> now, here's the problem. I don't know how to play Aussie Rules footy. <laughs> Aussie Rules might as well be Fantasyland rules, because I have no idea. But... Despite the way the game looks, despite the fact that it's incomprehensible to every everyone outside of Australia, <laughs> it was a hit. This game caught on. It this did. This managed to actually find an audience. It got national TV coverage in Australia, mm -hmm. and it sold a whole boatload of copies. They finally found their niche. They were all like, you know what? Screw those other pub publishers, because for this, they self-published, and they could only publish inside of Australia. And you know what? That's better than having to make Back okay, to the Future Okay, okay, no, hold on. Australia, why is... Why is your ref there, like, a fucking FBI agent? Well, he's got to blend in, you know? I... You can't let the players see him. <laughs> well, I'm getting pounded at football here. But you know what else they did? The next year... Uh-huh, what'd they make? They capitalized on the success of that game with International Cricket. Now, this one's a personal favorite. Now, like the last game, they acted as their own publisher, only released in Australia, only playable in PAL, and you'll get glitches, as you see here, if you try to play it in NTSC. I like this game a lot more than the other game, though. This... And you'll see why. Okay, I'm already liking this. I see the same kind of aesthetic from the other game, but... Mm-hmm. Keeping a lot of it the same. Oh, run, 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 run! Oh, I'm out. Another guy in a nice suit! Looks like I'm out for a duck. You... You TF'd into a duck! Uh-huh. Okay, so I think I found my favorite... Oh, I got four runs! Yes! Run, 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 run! I wish I knew how cricket worked, oh. anyway. Hey, how's that? Out. Oh. Am, I, am I out for a duck? Yep, another player gets transformed duck into a TF. duck. Soon enough, you run out of players, and soon your team is full of nothing but ducks. <laughs> oh, out for That's another just duck! Cricket. See, this one I kind of get. It's kind of like baseball, and you have to run back and forth after you hit the ball, and you have to be safe, because if they hit those poles, you're out. And you get how's that, and then one of your team members turns into a duck. Mm hmm. We just don't have the technology for turning people into ducks here in America, so it's why it's mm -hmm. never caught on. We couldn't handle it. Oh, my end is over. Alright. Oh, it looks like... there. Certainly See, that I got was an out. good. God! All of you are ducks! Hey! Hey! Excuse me. See, I'm the pitcher this time. Got him out. Oh, now you are out for a duck. <laughs> How cruel you are, fate. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't fully understand this, but I like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really like it. Oh, bold him. And he's out for a duck. <laughs> Alright, so if you get out, and if you hit a dude, they turn into a duck. All right, so, uh, next time, do you think that'll work in baseball? Oh, maybe. I don't think they've ever tried it. Okay. So many ducks on both teams now. I don't know how we're going to continue the game, but that's international cricket. Uh, I recommend it. It's actually pretty well done for an NES cricket game. I was going to say, I can't hear you over the quacking. <laughs> but for now, let's move on. Let's forget mm -hmm. the horrible times. Let's get to something else they wanted to do in 1992. Mm. This is Mike Tyson's Intergalactic Power Punch. This was not released. This is a prototype version that was discovered several years back. And for many years, uh, I've mentioned before I'm part of a, uh, a preservation group called Lost Levels. We track down NES prototypes and try and dump and release them. We were looking for this for a long time, because this is the sequel, or pseudo-sequel, to Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, made by Beam Software. By Beam Software, of all people! They picked up the Tyson license after Nintendo dropped him, and they decided, you know what? 
Time to put him in a boxing game. And look at this, this part's important. This opens with Tyson being all like, I'll beat anyone, anywhere, anytime. And then his friend Don King comes in and says, no one can beat Mike Tyson. He is. He is. See, I'm stopping it right there because mm -hmm. one of the few screens ever released of this game that ever appeared in magazines featured that text right there. No one can beat Mike Tyson. He is. And for years, decades, we wondered, what is he? <laughs> It caught it mid-sentence. We wouldn't know what Don King was saying unless we found and preserved this game. Danny? Uh-huh. He's a boxer. No. You can't know for sure, though. <laughs> what was he going to say? So I'm here to show you right now. What We're is Mike Tyson? Mystery. After all these years, we finally found out Mike Tyson is... The best! He's the best. You're right. You're right. That's, 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 uh -huh. that's different from boxer, yeah. He is a duck, says Video Game King. <laughs> now, I should note, Mike Tyson was still the heavyweight champ at this point. I don't think Buster Douglas had beaten him. Uh, the other guy you saw him with was his promoter at the time, Don King. Mm -hmm. Also a terrible person, like yeah. Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don King, famous for stomping a person to death, among other things. Yeah! Uh... And even in the years afterward, he and Mike kind of, they were on the outs. Uh, I think one famous quote Mike Tyson said about him, he is a slimy reptilian motherfucker, is how he described Don King. So it's interesting that he would appear in this NES game. Yeah! And in fact, he's there in the background. Look uh, look by the timer on the right. Oh, I oh my god! He this is co-starring Don King. Now the plot is, Mike Tyson said, no one on Earth can beat me. So the aliens say, oh yeah? And you gotta fight the aliens. <laughs> Alright, kick some alien ass, baby. All right, Mike Tyson, human, ex-champion of the Earth. Okay, so I guess he lost the uh, the heavyweight belt by this point. Mm. And you play as Mike Tyson. You got a train, you got a box, and I'm not going to show much more of this for reasons that are become a, that'll become apparent in a second. But there were other things that happened to Mike Tyson in 1992. Things that made his license really unappealing. Mm -hmm. So they took out the Mike Tyson license and eventually released it here in the States as Power Punch 2. This game was released, I should note, emphasizing that. So I'm going to fast forward here so we can see this redone intro. The text in the prototype and the release version differed, by the way, which is why we were so excited to see what Mike Tyson was in the prototype. The best! Alright, so this part looks a little bit the same. I feel real good. I didn't even work up a sweat. Okay. This time. Yeah, Buster don't really... Douglas was nothing. He'll never beat Mike Tyson. <laughs> don't know if I like his mouth animation there. Yeah, and here's Don King. <laughs> no one could beat Tough Guy. He's untouchable. Oh, it's different text, too! Uh-huh, see? Dang. He's not the best. Mm hmm Just untouchable. Should note that this character was renamed. He is now Mark Tyler. <laughs> and the, news ah! and the ah. newspaper there says Tyler instead of Tyson. Also, it's the Bing newspaper brought to you by Microsoft. Yeah, otherwise it's mostly the same. Let's get this started. Oh, who are we finding this time? It's not Iron Mike, it's Mark Tyler. He's never lost, unlike Mike Tyson. Mm-hmm, he's, he's better. He's like... He's very much unlike Mike Tyson. All those charges? No, he didn't do any of those things. Let's skip the workout. Mike didn't need to work out when he was fighting Buster Douglas. Neither do I. <laughs> yeah, he... Danny with the constant Mike Tyson uh, <laughs> shade here. Hey, everyone was talking about Mike Tyson. In yeah, the 90s. I remember. He was unbeatable. I was, I was alive during the nineties. Got the 80s. heavyweight belt at the age of twenty. That is nuts. I was gonna say at the age of two. <laughs> at the age of two. Also note, uh, Don King has lost his trademark hair up there, but he's still in the game, in spirit. And otherwise, this is largely untouched. Just no Mike Tyson license. Mm -hmm. I can't really tell you if the ending's different, because this game sucks to play, and I'm only going to play like 10 more seconds of it. Suffice to say, it's no punch-out. And 
having the Tyson license was a really... It was a really bad time to do that, I'll just say. <laughs> At the time, they thought they were getting a deal. They were all like, oh man, Nintendo dropped him, we can just scoop him right on up. It didn't work out that way. And instead, all we got was an unlicensed, or rather, sans license, power punch. And it's bad. And he's kicking your ass. Yeah. Sorry, Mark Tyler. Sorry, Don King. Actually, no, I'm not sorry. I was gonna say, <laughs> Don King is kind of a piece of shit, and so is Mike Tyson. That's okay. They are. Yeah, it's, it was just a big shit sandwich. Everyone deserved each other. But let's move on to better things, like Nightshade. Beam Software made freaking Nightshade. <laughs> now yeah, this, this game... this game is liked. This Enjoy is even. published by Ultra Games, so Konami. And thus, I guess they had a Konami budget and enough time to make a good game. Because this is, in fact, a good game. It's not based on a license. It's not based on one of their previous games. This is entirely original. Oh, I love that version of the logo. Wow. It's a point-and-click adventure game for the NES, and it's not garbage. It has kind of a noir vibe to it, too. I'm, I'm already digging this. Hold on. Yeah, groove out. Get your nightshade groove on. The main character has this, like, uh, running narration in his head. Mm -hmm. He's all like... Streets suck. And the superhero who, protect, who protects the city has been captured. Oh. Uh, again? So it's up to a newcomer. A new guy, to even the odds, to take out the bad guys, make the city safe for everyone. And as we start the game, we've been captured, and we're about to be killed. Oh, cool! It's Anubis. <laughs> yeah, the the main bad guy is Anubis. <laughs> Dang! Anubis. He sets you in a room with a bomb, and you're tied to a chair, and you have to very quickly get behind this wall, or else the bomb will really hurt you. So already a really unique start to an NES game. You mm -hmm. don't know what you're doing, you're tied to a chair, you're about to die. It just instantly puts you into the game. And then you gotta go up against this candle, and you're free. I really like the graphics in this game, actually. This is really nice looking. Yeah, unlike every other Beam Software game, this game has really good character art and graphics. Yeah, the HUD is like, yeah, I agree, Frumple, the HUD is so good. And you got a, a cursor, you can examine things. And yeah, the writing is really sassy, which is really unusual for an NES game. Mm -hmm. I can't think of another NES game that had sassy writing Yeah, like it's this. got a real fun sense of humor. Also, you're hollering about the Anubis. Mm-hmm. This I is mean, back in the day when most text was like, I feel asleep. <laughs> so for it to be comprehensible, much less funny, is really rare. But it's not just an adventure game. It's a freaking one-on-one -on -one fighting game. <laughs> so I guess they used some stuff from that uh, uh, Exploding Fist and... Or Bad Street Brawler. Or Bad Street Bra Brawler, which just looks more like than... Honestly, these parts aren't amazing, but they break things up a little bit. It's something a little bit different. Yeah, this... Hamburglar! This did remind me of Darkman when uh, I actually played it. I actually used to confuse this and Darkman quite a bit for the NES. This game's great, though. Yeah, Dark, Dark Man's made great. by Ocean. <laughs> Crowbar is engraved to my dearest Irma. <laughs> uh, how do you pick up things? It's like start or something. Select. Okay. I need this crowbar. Yeah, in many ways it's your typical point-and-click game, where you use items, pick up things, examine things. Oh, hey. Something behind it. What is it? It's operated. Wait, create quivering enigmas with a side salad and a light tartar sauce. There's a hidden exit here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's... Oh, wow. no. You fell through a <laughs> and I lost some health. There's one thing I don't like. It's the fact that if you don't do the puzzles right, you lose some health. Mm -hmm. There, There is a health bar in this game, which is kind of unusual for a point-and-clicker. Let's use that lever. Then I think to get out of here, we have to use this other switch over here. But 
yeah, I have played through the whole thing. I've beaten this game, and I can confirm it's good. It's real good. Kind of unbelievably good. Oh, so, uh, Avi with some good info here. Uh, the lead designer on this game also handled, uh, their Punisher and Shadowrun games. And went on to try dialogue for those Discworld point and clicks. Oh, wow. Alright, so you can trace Shadowrun to this game. That's Actually, a game we're gonna play in the second half. Bob, Bobinator has a... Speaking of that, Bobinator has a real good fact here. Apparently Shadowrun started off in its earliest stages as a sequel to Nightshade. Oh my god. Yeah, that at the start. Sense. At the start it said uh, chapter one, so I guess they were planning a sequel, and they just ended up basing it on Shadowrun, which we'll get to. I mm -hmm. won't get to it now, but suffice to say Shadowrun's a pretty important part of the story. Yeah, it's it's good. Oh boy, look at this. Oh, that looks cool! I think later on in the game you can turn this off and then jump across, but not right now. But yeah, the backgrounds, the art, the... even the gameplay. <laughs> Who switched out the Beam Software team? <laughs> it's probably more like they just had an actual budget and enough time to make a good game, because, mm -hmm. again, they were capable of it, it's just not really possible when you're working for LJN or Acclaim. Also, uh, if you can, go examine that grate that you saw. Ooh. Oh, I already got rid of the grate. He, ah, sa he says it's a great grate. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and there's this full explorable city, all these different side quests. And you'll notice I have a popularity meter there. That's actually important, because what you do in this game is you serve as a superhero. You go around saving people, just doing good deeds. And as you do that, your popularity will fill up, and eventually you get to the point where people actually like you, and they try and help you out instead of just shutting you out. Can I go in here? Hmm. What's this guy gotta say? Hot nuts, sir. Extra tasty. Uh, I like him. I'm just gonna... I'm just gonna go over here. No, 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 no! I... <laughs> yep, just wandering around looking for something to do. Some people to help. You, homeless citizen. Uh, you need anything? Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Alright. Oh no! That cat! Save the cat, Danny! That cat's being chased by a dog! Um, okay, I got this. Don't worry. Okay. Use bone on dog. Connect paddywhack. And look, I got a little bit of popularity from helping out the cat. Everyone loves that cat. <laughs> if you do something for that cat, you are just putting mm -hmm. in people's hands. Yeah, that, that cat is famous over here in Nightshade World. But that's just one of the many things you can do. Oh, here's here's another situation. Here's an old lady you have to help out. I don't think we can help her now. I think we have to find a stepladder or something. Aww. Okay, okay, that character art's pretty bad, but... That's... <laughs> but this is... If Back to the Future 2 and 3 was the bad kind of ambitious, this is the good kind. Mm -hmm. This is focused. This is workable. This is something that might actually be entertaining, God forbid. Who's that in the bushes? Come fight me. Oh, that was cool. Oh my god. Stupid British gentleman. Oh <laughs> no! You just sunk into the earth! Sad! Oh, and here's another great thing. When you die, you get put in these death traps. <laughs> and the, and uh, Anubis calls you Lampshade. And there's different death traps. There's three of them, because you get three lives, and you have to figure your way out before you uh, get crushed or killed somehow. Mm. In this case, you have to wait till your foot is next to this lever, and then you operate it. Oh no! That was that was the speed up letter, lever. Uh, I was killed. <laughs> well, rip. <laughs> but you can't escape from them. Uh, I think eventually it does put you in an inescapable death trap, and that's when your game's over. Mm. But, so yeah, to wrap things up, great game. Play Nightshade. Mm, definitely. Play, play that game. Don't play Back to the Future. <laughs> And Chad was mentioning it, but it does make a lot of sense that this was actually pretty good, considering they started with adventure games, and they kind of, especially text-based ones, and yeah. 
I have achieved complete weed status. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nightshade has completed 420% of the game. Legalize beam software, baby. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. All right, so that's an overview of what they did for the NES. Uh, yeah, mostly awful, because there were all these predatory publishers just telling you to put out whatever shit you made in a couple weeks, and we'd pay you. That's enough to keep you in business after you got screwed over by your publisher. And here's poor Beam Software just scraping together, doing whatever they can to survive, even if it means making some of the worst games ever made. But given their history and their abilities, they could make really good games, mm -hmm. including a really memorable and super excellent NES adventure game. Again, Nightshade, check it out. Highly recommended. That, that does look cool. I actually may check it out myself. It's great. Can't say enough good things about Nightshade. <laughs> 